It's what you hearing. It's what you hearing. Listen. It's what you hearing. Listen. It's what you hearing. Listen. Ladies and gentlemen. X go give it to ya. If I pray for you to get it on your own, X go deliver to ya. Knock, knock, open up the door to spread. Mr. Crawford's here. Let's talk about some nonsense with this guy, Marcus Gabriel. This is a this is Emmanuel Kant's great grandson, something like that. He certainly hasn't changed any of the paintings in the house since Immanuel Kant died. Actually, I don't think Immanuel Kant had any kids, but if, if there were a direct lineage, and father took after son, and father took after son, and father took after son, then this is Immanuel Kant right here. Now we're going to start at 1634. He says the world does not exist. Only the facts inside of it exist. Well, I'll let him make the case, but we're going to start at 1634, and then we're going to go back to the beginning and do a bit there. So whenever you use something like that, what you're really giving voice to is fear, okay? Namely the fear of infinity. You're not looking into how things really are. And if I... So when you... He just listed a bunch of worldviews. He says when you're using one of these worldviews, what you're really showing is fear. Because... The, the real facts that we are presented with is a non-finite list of facts. That's what our, our reality is. There isn't a, you can't actually zoom out and see the real whole world. We are all ultimately zoomed in all the time and we can only see the facts. And if, even if we tried to list them all, we could never list all the facts. So we're surrounded by an infinity of facts. And the world itself is a zoom out option we just don't have. So... If you choose a worldview that tries to make sense of this, then what you're actually doing is putting a shroud over a bunch of infinities. And it's false. It's, it's not, not factual, it's not true, it's not objective to put a shroud over these infinities. If you do this, he labels it fearful. That is why I view his sense of life as being equivalent to Immanuel Kant. Not only that, but his philosophy. His sense of life <clears throat> is um, a, a vision of human beings cringing in some dark corner of the universe surrounded by an unknowable uh, miasma, an fin infinitely massive miasma of facts, which cannot be untangled. And there's too many of them. Far, far too many. So, that's, that's his view of the world. He's a, he, he, he views it as a very frightening, very scary, very dark place with a very fearful creature um, cowering somewhere in the corner, unable to know anything. To give you a world picture, okay, again, I could only give you a metaphor in order to show you how I believe things look once you give up the fantasy of the world. Okay? So here's how things look once the world's gone. Think of it this way. In this very moment, all our lives intersect, and they all intersect with an, with an TEDx, TEDx event, okay? People watching this intersect currently with our lives, and all these things intersect in manifold ways. And if you really want to find out how they intersect, you have to talk to the people, you have to do particular research on how people interpret what I'm saying, etc. All these things intersect. So he knows nothing about his situation right now at that TED conference. He knows nothing about it, because people are watching him and he knows nothing about those people and he knows nothing about what those people think of him or what they think of other stuff and how other stuff affects those people and since all of these facts are interrelated therefore and since there are too many of them and he can't know them therefore he is crippled and his mind is cowering in one little teeny lit spot of this which is his local awareness and all of these facts out around him far away from him he'll never know and can never know constitute the real reality that um, he's actually cut off from. While I'm saying this, my neurons are firing, your neurons are firing, okay, uh, some volcano is exploding in a galaxy far away and will never be observed, etc. All these detailed things are happening right now. Maybe a really crazy Martian creature is writing a book by the title, Why the World Really Does Exist, okay, or another version of the Bible. They call it the Schmeibel over there, okay. So, 
all of this is really happening, and I think what we need to do now, okay, and I think that's, that's an important step for humanity, is we really have to give up the idea that all things are connected. Some things are connected, and some things are not. We now, can we make the case that some things are not connected? I think we could make the case, but it would be a cosmic case. Uh, we're not going to be able to do it on the planet Earth. That would be ridiculous. For example, um, for all he knows, there's some um, amateur philosopher intellectual watching him who is making some video about him making fun of him. And that amateur philosopher is part of a movement that's going to change and take over the world. And he has no idea about that movement. He's not aware of it. And not only that, but that movement and the facts of that movement say that him and everything he says on this stage right now in this speech is totally ridiculous bunk. He doesn't realize that that's the case, but it is the case. He doesn't realize the future of the world entails that his philosophy will wither away, but that is the case. He kills himself off. Venezuela's dying. Russia died. China, insofar as it is thriving, has changed, and it's not that system. Insofar as it is that system still, it is dying. That system meaning viewing reality as an unknowable miasma of facts, so you just have to figure out some way to be practical about you and your life. You can't really know the true reality out there. You're cut off for some reason in some way. That's his view of the world. Now, shall we go a little bit through it here? and this event. So I think that all these things exist, but So he's just saying here that the, the, the facts in the world exist. One thing which really does not exist, namely the world. So all of this uh, hopefully sounds crazy. Uh, uh, exactly one thing which really does not exist, namely really democratic elections, law of vulnerability, and this event. So I think that all these things exist, but there's exactly one thing which really does not exist, namely the world. So all of this uh, hopefully sounds crazy, uh, uh, which gives me the chance to elaborate and show you what that really means and why I think that this has revolutionary consequences, not just for philosophy as a discipline, but for our overall way of looking at what we still call the world. Okay, so my talk uh, bears the title, Why the World Does Not Exist, and I will more particularly talk about what the world is. I will talk about existence. Um, let's begin with the world. Okay, so there are these weird words that we constantly use in our everyday language, uh, also in science, and pretty much everywhere, in order to describe the impression that we are part of a really big thing. Okay, and then we have all these words to refer to this really big thing. Nature, reality, the universe, okay, the world. And all these terms, okay, or if you're, you know, slightly more spiritual, maybe you want to say God or being. And all these terms seem to refer to, like, the maximally big thing, the biggest thing. Okay, not just this planet. Imagine, imagine there's something which you might call Google Universe. Okay, hopefully, you know, that's the future of search. Okay, and then at some point there will be Google Universe. So you can just zoom out and zoom out and zoom out. And what you see, if you maximally zoom out, okay, that's the world. That's the universe. And in this whole thing are reality. And in this big thing, we are somewhere. Okay, somewhere in the Milky Way, a tiny part, not really important, some kind of ants in the big picture. Okay. But I believe that there is no such thing as this picture. I think that the, the, the whole train of thought which I just presented is really an illusion. Okay? The world is an illusion. Now, that really sounds like something Buddhist or, uh, or Indian, but it isn't. It's, uh, you will see it's exactly the opposite. So, what is the world, then, really? Exactly the opposite, or just some other version of that crap? Well, philosophers have tried to clarify this for pretty much 2,500 years, and arguably, the world, in that sense, has been invented at some point in history. All right. When was the world invented? Who started philosophy? Who was the first philosopher? I want names, damn it. I want names, okay? Don't tell me the Buddhists started philosophy. They were a thousand years after Socrates, okay? I want names. And I can give you, I'll give you the names, damn it. I'll give you, who, who do you want? Uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. And then there were a handful before them and a whole bunch after them. And you can also name, you know, Pythagoras and... Um, uh, uh, G, uh, G geometricians, you know, guys in geometry and mathematicians as philosophers, as helping start out what we th consider philosophy. But it would have to be Plato. He would have to be um, the first philosopher. Uh, there was the guy before that, Democritus, who said everything is one substance, and he was trying to unite everything. He was a philosopher of some kind, but the problem is we don't have published works 
of a massive a body of published works to really go over what they believe. The first philosopher we have is Plato. There were some philosophers before that, but uh, philosophy as we know it started in Greece. Um, religious writings and religious texts existed before that, but philosophy as we know it, the secular investigation uh, of history, of mankind, of science, that started in Greece. Um, Aristotle came from Macedonia. He was an immigrant from Macedonia up north of Greece. There were lots of colonies in Turkey that were peopled by Greeks. Troy was one of these, right? The great city that was burned in the Great War. That was a Greek colony in Turkey, right? In what is now Turkey, okay? So oh, that's where philosophy started. In what is now Turkey. All right. Wrong. Unless unless it was started by Theophrastus or Democritus or one of those guys. Theophrastus came after Aristotle, didn't he? That at some point in history, in what is now Turkey, okay? So the, the philosophy didn't originate in in the Western tradition in Greece, but in Turkey. Philosophy. Is now we know he's a jerk, don't we? Now, is he going to give us any names for that claim to negate everything we already know about, that we've already learned about everything? Is he going to give us any names? He's just deriding Greece. He's just throwing out. He's not even giving names of the Greeks, is he? He's just saying it started in Turkey. He's not saying forget Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates. He's not saying forget the Greek tradition. He's not saying anything like that. He's just saying forget the Greeks, period without a thought for them. That at some point in history, in what is now Turkey, okay, so the, the philosophy didn't originate in, in the Western tradition in Greece, but in Turkey. Philosophy is a Turkish project. And uh, what happened, okay, at a particular coast, uh, is that people thought, well, look. Now, is that all he has to say about it? No names or anything, huh? Philosophy is a Turkish project, not a Greek project. Turkey, okay, so the, the philosophy didn't originate in, in the Western tradition in Greece, but in Turkey. Philosophy is a Turkish project. And uh, what happened, okay... Wow, what a jerk. What a jerk. Go ahead and defend that, Mr. Gabriel, if you can. Give us five or ten pages on these brilliant uh, Turkish philosophers. At a particular coast uh, is that people thought, well, look... Um, what and he did just say over by the coast, and that's Greek colonies. ...even mean that we are around. Okay, so imagine at some point people were hunting and protecting themselves from wild animals, etc. They were interested, well, they had a hard time even find, finding good food. Imagine the food that you have to have in the savannah, okay, or when we're still living in caves. I don't want to eat that. That's horrible. That's a bad time. Okay, so in that time people were really interested in just surviving. But at some point when survival was pretty much guaranteed, etc., okay, people were wondering, but what does all of this mean? What's going on? Where am I? Okay, and the answer they gave is, well, I am in the world. Okay? And the world is this really big thing. And this, is, this triggered a huge process of civilization, which philosophers call metaphysics. Metaphysics is a philosophical discipline, and I... All right, so that was a pretty... Wow. So, philosophy was people conceiving the world. And then they came to metaphysics. Now, he's a little confused about metaphysics, okay? Let me just say before he wrecks his train, just so that we can take off in our little airplane and fly above his train wreck, okay? Metaphysics is a very short subject. It says that there is a universe, you know, and that, that's the end of it. Or there's a world, there's something your senses are perceiving that's out there. It's independent of you and it has its own uh, independent nature. Now those things are kind of advanced. You actually get to those that you go out and start bumping around the world. Um, but metaphysics is a very short subject. It really just says that there's stuff out there. Um, epistemology says you exist and you have a mind and you're looking at stuff. But metaphysics is a very short subject. It just says that there's stuff out there. Now he is eternally confused about metaphysics, of course. Which philosophers call metaphysics. Metaphysics is a philosophical discipline, and I define that discipline as the attempt okay, to develop a theory of the world as world. Or a a theory of the world as world. So a theory of the whole thing, right? Well, that's kind of what the objectivist idea of it is, except it's very short. It just says something's out there. Period. Now, he wants, he wants metaphysics, the theory of the world as world, to be 
um, some sort of all-encompassing omniscient knowledge. For example, uh, we're going to have to know about dark matter and string theory, and we're going to have to have a list of every single fact in the universe, including what's going on in other galaxies and what's the political elections on other planets. And we're going to have to have all this information to put it on our list, and then we'll be able to have a complete and total theory of the world as the world. That's his view of metaphysics. Omniscient, omnipotence, or it fails. So we can't. We have to throw away the world. Discipline as the attempt, okay, to develop a theory of the world as world, or a theory of absolutely everything. Okay. So what we now know is, so we're looking for this big theory of absolutely everything. The next absolutely everything, not just saying that, but to get a theory of. And not just everything, but absolutely everything. That's why I say he wants to make a list of every single fact. Now he's going to go on later and say that once you get your list of all the facts written down, uh, you're going to have to have another list that lists the fact that you've listed all the facts. And so you're li and then you're going to have to have a list to list that. So your list is you're never going to be done making these lists of facts. So um, not only do you have to list all the facts to get a theory of everything. You can't list all the facts, so you can't have a theory of everything. Now, strangely enough, this is his theory of everything, isn't it? This is his view of metaphysics. A theory of absolutely everything, okay? So what we now know is, so we're looking for this big theory of absolutely everything. He's presenting a big theory of absolutely everything, isn't he? Really fundamental theory. We really want to know what it is, okay? So if that's the spirit which drives you, the unification of physics or whatever, okay, then the world formula Okay, then you're a metaphysician. This is what you're doing. Okay, and I believe that it's an illusion. Okay, so so he is a metaphysician who is saying that metaphysics is an illusion, and according to his claim, people who are looking for a theory of everything are metaphysicians, and they're dealing with an illusion. He is making claims about everything, and he is claiming that everything is an illusion. The world is this maximally big thing, and how can we really characterize, uh, characterize that thing? So let me give you two very prominent definitions of the world that you can find throughout the history of philosophy and show you okay, how philosophers really operate when it comes to these things before we can see why there is no such thing as the world. Okay. All right, so he believes there is an infinite number of facts out there. He doesn't know how to relate them. They scare him. He's frightened. And so he is putting a bizarre shroud over all of those facts in order to um, make it easier for him to deal with them. And the shroud that he's putting over them is, they are too many. He's putting like a hall of mirrors down every, every place where there's one fact, he puts a mirror next to it and then a mirror next to that. So when he looks at it, it looks like it's in an infinite regression of facts forever. He, he is looking into a hall of mirrors in every direction. And he does not believe that we can ever get to know all of these illusions and delusions. Um, and therefore, he has put a shroud over it. The shroud he's put over it is, don't worry, it's impossible, metaphysically impossible, to come to grips with all of this stuff. So, therefore, since we can't come to grips with all this stuff, there's no reality in talking about it as a coherent whole, as if we could come to grips with it all. So just let it go. Just cower in fear and pretend that we know nothing. That's a pretty elaborate theory to come at the end and say uh, we know nothing and we can't have any knowledge. right? Pretty elaborate theory and he's claiming a lot of knowledge. He's claiming to know something, isn't he? In fact, he's claiming to know something about everything about all these facts so that if I make a list of all these facts his theory is going to fit it no matter how long my list is no matter how many facts I put down it's going to fit his theory that's what his claim is now he's also claiming that people who make up stuff like this are delusional and they are hiding they are hiding from the real reality that's just too big for them to face now, he's right about that last part, isn't he? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Cropper. If you support what I'm doing, please patronize me. Uh, if I can get enough support, I can spend more time doing this. 
when I first came on I was spending a lot of time at this and uh, I will occasionally be able to spend large amounts of time but if I can get Patreon support then I can make it very regular. Um, so please go jump on there and give me five or ten bucks a month and let's try to build up a stream of support so that I can give up my second job and do some debates and interviews and uh, make fun of guys like this, Kantian idiots who go around saying let me explain to you why you're wrong and then he just gives a psychological vomit of, of, of his own mistaken beliefs. Thank you for tuning in.